The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Uh, I'm, I'm there with you. Uh, my name is Mark Hinkle. I'm the Vice President of Community at Cloud.com. And this is Build an Open Source Cloud Day self. So thanks for showing up. Um, our program today is a lecture style program. And we're going to talk about open source software to build and manage cloud computing, specifically compute clouds. So uh, how many people here are using some form of cloud computing today? All right. How many people here use like Amazon EC2? All right. What we're going to do is we're going to be able to show you what software to use so that you can um, deploy cloud computing on your own hardware. Um, that's typically called infrastructure as a service um, within your own data and that within your own data center that would be private cloud. Um, cloud.com, a little bit about us. We make an open source project product called CloudStack. Um, CloudStack is the orchestration layer that allows you to manage your virtual machines as a cloud. Um, later today, we're going to have OpenStack, which is an um, open source project that's very similar, sponsored by Rackspace and a number of other people. Uh, we are also active in that community. And then this afternoon, we're going to talk a little bit about how you manage that cloud, and we're going to have um, Garrett Honeycutt from Puppet Labs. Um, anybody here use Puppet? Okay. Puppet is a, uh, um, helps you automate the configuration of your, uh, of your infrastructure, and in a cloudy environment, that's going to be a big advantage. So um, first half of today, we'll start with compute clouds. Um, David Nally from cloud.com is our, our community manager. He's going to uh, um, walk you through cloud stack, what it is, what it does, how you can use it. And uh, then we'll take a break in about an hour and a half. Um, if there's yeah, anybody has any questions or um, concerns throughout the day, let me know. Um, we have lunch ordered, right? OK, so we have box lunch ordered for everyone. Um, uh, 1230, we'll, we'll uh, break for lunch. And then uh, um, that's it. All right, so we'll let David take it away. All right, so my name is David Nally, and uh, I'm one of the community guys at cloud.com. Um, I'm also involved in a number of other open source projects, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself and, and um, maybe give you reasons to listen to me or to not listen to me. Um, I've been contributing to open source for about eight years now. Um, I uh, contribute heavily to the Fedora project uh, and a, a number of others. Uh, over the years, I've contributed to uh, Sahana which is disaster management, uh, open groupware, which is an open source groupware package, um, and a few others here and there uh, to lesser degrees. Um, within Fedora, I'm a packager. I write documentation, although I do less of that now. Um, and, uh, and I'm currently serving a term on the Fedora board. We'll see if that lasts or not. Um, to tell you a little bit about CloudStack, uh, they chose a name that I think was unfortunate, VMOps, uh, in 2008, started developing the uh, project. And um, uh, so it's the, the actual software has been around for about three years. In 2010, they changed their name, and they realized that it needed to be open sourced. It was historically a proprietary project. So in May 2010, they open sourced it. It's available under a GPL v3 license. Um, so uh, I regularly give this presentation, and, and the, the first question always comes out, what is cloud computing? Um, I've, had, uh, I've had places that are Fortune 500 companies, 
and I've had multi-billion dollar defense contractors come up to me and say, I have no idea what cloud computing is, but I've been told by senior management that we must have a cloud computing strategy, and so I'm here to learn. And, and I honestly believe that if you called anything cloud, you could sell it. Um, I, I'm actively looking to sell cloud sandwiches and, uh, and other things, and I think that there is a burgeoning market there. Uh, so, real quickly, there's, there's three big types of, uh, of clouds. The first is software as a service. And if you want to think of Flickr or Gmail or um, Salesforce.com, that is your software as a service. Um, if you actually care about open source, uh, Identica, um, uh, WordPress.com, et cetera, are, are decent open source examples of that. Um, there's platform as a service, uh, and, and the most famous one out there is Google App Engine. Um, and uh, that's essentially providing you a place to run your code, and they will take care of scaling your code uh, in their environment, um, and will take care of all the uptimes and things of that nature. So you control the data and the actual software that's running, and they'll, they'll take care of the, uh, what is effectively the app server and, uh, and of course, the underlying infrastructure from there. Um, the most famous one is Google App Engine. Um, there's, some, uh, there's some interesting efforts into open source um, paths environments. Uh, Cloud Foundry has been announced. Uh, it seems a bit nascent at the moment. Uh, it's a VMware, um, a VMware project. Uh, Red Hat just recently at their summit announced uh, um, their, uh, their effectively their Java and, and I think it's Ruby and Python as well, um, pass offering. Um, and that came out of I think their, their purchase of Makara. Um, there are a number of others. Heroku is also a well-known one, um, sadly not open source. And finally what, what most of the conversation today will be about is infrastructure as a service. And I used to divide that into two realms, uh, compute and storage. And uh, I think that that's rapidly going into three now, compute, storage, and networking. Um, and so effectively, this will, it provides you uh, the CPU, or it provides you the, the raw storage, or it provides you um, the networking abstraction. And you provide everything above that. You provide the operating system, the configuration, et cetera. Um, and so cloud computing is really about abstraction. Uh, typically, you're, you're abstracting away from the end users, be that people within your own company or if it's uh, people, uh, end users that are purchasing a service from you. You're abstracting the management of something, either the underlying infrastructure, the platform, or, or the software completely. So cloud stack is a free as in speech and beer highly available, multi-tenant, uh, multi-hypervisor, cross-hypervisor, uh, complex networking and firewall um, management, uh, management platform for cloud computing. Um, and that's very buzzword laden. And those of you who forgot to pick up your buzzword bingo cards, um, I apologize. We should have, should have called that out before we got seated. Um, Sadly, without going in and showing you, I don't know of a way to tell you what CloudStack does without using the buzzwords. Um, and I should add, if you have questions, please interrupt me. Uh, if you want to listen to me talk, my seven or eight slides will not fill up this time, and you will be bored senseless and not gain anything on top of that. Um, to give you a quick infrastructure overview, uh, we have a management server and a database. Uh, the management server runs on Tomcat. Um, database currently is MySQL. I would like to see MySQL and Postgres support, but um, not, not a high priority at the moment, so MySQL. Um, virtually everyone who does this uh, clusters MySQL and the uh, Tomcat instances for better availability. Um, we have compute nodes, and we support multiple hypervisors, and those are KVM, currently KVM, uh, Zen Cloud Platform, and Zen Server. Um, we have some, uh, 
we have to make use of some VMware code that is not open source. So our VMware stuff is, is not free as in speech. Um, and so I tend to not talk about it. Um, but that's not a result of our code. It's a result of, uh, of VMware's SDK not being open sourced. Um, we are rapidly adding additional hypervisors. Um, Oracle VM is coming. Uh, there are a couple of other that, others that are already checked into our source code repository. Um, and uh, so additional hypervisors are coming up rapidly. Uh, we have this idea of primary and secondary storage. And primary storage is the actual storage that your virtual machines run from. Uh, officially, we support NFS and iSCSI. Uh, unofficially, we'll support anything that can be a shared mount point and is a file system. Um, we just had someone drop a patch on the development mailing list for clustered LVM. Um, and uh, we've got people working on Gluster and Sheepdog, um, which are both distributed storage, uh, storage platforms. So that's, that's where the actual virtual machines are running. We have secondary storage, which is, uh, which is where we store templates. So we, we don't start out with this idea of a blank disk generally. Generally, you start from some building blocks. And those building blocks are um, a predefined image. So, so when you install CloudStack, it will automatically download a, um, a CentOS 5.5 image. And you can boot that up, and it will, it will just work out of the box for you. Um, that actual template is stored in secondary storage. Um, we do that for a couple of reasons. The first is um, storing templates and everything else and having to, uh, to spin off you know, what may be a 30 or 40 gig image off of your primary storage puts incredible load uh, from a storage perspective. And if you're spinning up 50 machines, you just killed a lot of I.O. really quickly. Um, with regards to a couple of other things we use secondary storage for are snapshots. So uh, you have a running machine and you want to save the state, you can snapshot the machine and it will take a copy of that machine and push it to secondary storage. And so we're, we're effectively diversifying and hopefully providing a little bit of recovery ability by pushing that template or that snapshot to, uh, to secondary storage. Um, this is going to end up becoming secondary and tertiary storage. We're going to keep secondary storage for templates, and we're going to add object-based storage, and we're going to adopt OpenStack Swift, at least initially for that. Um, and, uh, and we'll have that tertiary storage doing uh, snapshot retention. Then we have some virtual resources that run as virtual machines. And technically, the secondary storage runs as a, a virtual machine that mounts, uh, mounts an NFS share right now. But uh, we have a router that will do routing, firewall, load balancing, VPN, um, a number of other uh, network functions, if you so desire. And that comes up as soon as you provision your first machine. And we also have a, con we also have a console proxy. Um, which allows you to get a VNC console from your web uh, from your web browser to any of these virtual machines, um, and this is since the UI at least is all over uh, from a web browser that effectively allows you even if you don't have network connectivity or there's something wrong with the machine and SSH hasn't come up, uh, you get you can get to the console relatively easily. I'll show you that in a bit. Um, I talked about the hypervisors we support. There's also an ECT, EC2 module. Um, and that allows you to, um, to either use your EC2 tools to, to deal with, uh, with CloudStack or to alternatively use CloudStack to manage your EC2 instances. So you can manage your public and or your private cloud from a single interface. Um, so cloud computing, the market is largely at the moment dominated by service providers. There are people who want to be Amazon, except not sell books. Um, and they want to sell EC2-like services. So 
the early adopters in cloud computing have tended to be service providers. Uh, so you have your Tata Communications, your Green Cloud, um, your GoDaddy and, and others that, uh, that want to sell cloud-like services um, and need a platform to do that. Those have been most of the early adopters. And uh, um, so the idea of multi-tenant came out really early. Uh, typically, even if you have uh, you know, role-based access control and, and segregated networks uh, for your sysadmins, those sysadmins typically have root on a collection of boxes. And segregation of control uh, is not, not something that's designed into most networks. That changes from time to time. But um, uh, effectively, uh, this is designed around providing end users and to very finely grain their access controls. Um, so you can have a user that can't provision a single machine that can get to a console. Um, you can have people who can provision machines and not see other people's machines. And I'll give you um, a decent example of that in just a minute. I'll show it to you in the UI. Um, so networking. Networking is the bane of cloud computing's existence. Um, because there are so many options, um, you know, especially when you start talking about geographically disparate clouds, uh, when you've got a data center in India, a data center in, uh, on the west coast, and a data center on the east coast, and you have to deal with networking issues between all three and manage them, that's a, that's a challenging uh, prospect. So we effectively manage um, uh, load balancing will load balance and, and even handle geographically disparate load balancing. Um, we'll do firewall, we'll do basic routing, and we'll also manage VLANs. Um, so you can have all of your VLANs. We also do security groups, and if you're a Zen server uh, user, you're, uh, you're probably familiar with security groups, but effectively that is um, that segregation based upon the host that the VM's running on. And it allows you to effectively firewall that because all the traffic's coming in through a bridge. And so you can quasi-isolate um, you can quasi-isolate hosts that are running from each other. So this is a this is a buzzword and it's the wrong buzzword, but it's also the buzzword that everyone knows. Um, CloudStack really doesn't provide what most people who are really knowledgeable about high availability would describe as high availability. We do provide some fault tolerance though. Um, we do some, some basic monitoring to determine if an instance has failed or if the compute node that it's running on has failed and to take specific actions. The first is to restart the node on the, restart the VM on the same machine um, we'll also uh, try and move the VM elsewhere. Uh, so we support migration uh, for HA-enabled um, HA VMs. And we, of course, say, you know, if you're going to have any HA, you're going to have that router, the router and, and secondary storage. Those have to be high availability, and those are by default. Um, what that allows you to do, though, is so KVM out of the box right now uh, does not have high availability or fault tolerance built in. It doesn't do automatic migration. Um, you can do that. Zen Server, the free, the free open source uh, edition, does not have high availability. And so you effectively uh, add that to those hypervisors uh, pretty seamlessly. Um, or you at least add fault tolerance. Um, so, there's much made of the UI. Most cloud platforms at this point, short of, um, short of VMware's offering and, and maybe one or two others, don't have uh, a web UI or at least not a complete web UI. Uh, for whatever reason, we started out with the idea that the UI was key to our success. Um, as a sysadmin or a recovering one, 
Um, I tend to disagree with that statement. I, I would far prefer the command line tools or an API. Um, and so uh, we have built the UI to, uh, to effectively just make API calls. So if you're going to enable the UI to do anything, there has to be a back-end API to do it. Uh, and so that allows us to, to do things like have your monitoring system say, oh wow, load is getting really high on that set of web servers, we need to spin up some more, and oh yeah, can you make sure that they're added to the load balancer? Um, and we can handle that. Um, we, can also, uh, we can also then integrate to billing systems. Uh-oh, we, uh, we started consuming a lot more bandwidth, it's time to alert the user that they're going to start seeing charges, excess charges because of their excess bandwidth usage. Um, or uh, you know any number of things we see we see people doing um, doing some stuff with Chef right now, which is a, another config management package. And uh, using that config management package, um, uh, they're able to call and provision a machine. Um, and I'm talking about code that they're trying to open source very rapidly, because a customer wrote it, a customer of Ops Code wrote it, and they're trying to jump through the their legal department right now to get that released under an Apache license. But they're effectively using Chef to, or they're actually using Knife to go in and say, hey, I need a new machine. Here's what I need on it. Um, and here's the, the configuration that will be applied to it once it's up. And it goes out, provisions the machine, assigns a network address, registers it in Chef, and Chef configures it when it comes up. Um, and so I, I'm fairly, fairly uh, pleased with the API. There's a couple of other open source projects that have decided to adopt our API um, because we at least have the, uh, the compute and, and networking side of things down. Sure. Um, So we've got, let me tell you what we have now. Sure, sure, so, so the question was, from a network management, can you, could you integrate that with something like uh, OpenBSD? And I'll take that a step further. Can you do hardware management? Uh, you know, if you have an F5 load balancer and you don't want to do software load balancing, uh, can you do that? The answer is yes, no one's written uh, OpenBSD, so if you're using like a PFSense or, or something like that, no one's written it. You can do it. Um, there are some non-free SDKs right now for, uh, and APIs for, um, for Cisco, for Juniper, and for F5, uh, and sadly none of them are open source, uh, which of course means we can't distribute them, but those exist, and if you were to acquire those, and I, they're free as in beer in the most cases, but they're not free as in speech. Um, if you acquire those, you could have CloudStack manage your networking stack, in, including that physical hardware. Right now, the open source bits that, are, that we claim that we support um, manage a software router, and that software router is based on Debian. Um, there's talk of us moving to Viata, which is an open source router. Um, and so the framework for doing that is there. The specific stuff, if you, for instance, wanted to manage that off of a PF sense box, is not, it's possible. We would welcome patches. Any other questions? So, so we handle a lot. I am bound and determined to rip this off me every time. We handle resources, uh, compute resources. Um, Largely because I think we, we uh, attack the service provider market first um, into three areas. We have zones, and typically our customers are, they're completely arbitrary. The names mean absolutely nothing. Um, but what we see is customers using zone to define a data center. Um, and so zones tend to be geographically disparate. Um, pods in most cases tend to be a rack of machines. Um, there are, 
There are certain large customers who use a cage to define a pod. But, uh, but in most cases, a pod is a rack of machines. And a cluster is a set of machines that are uh, um, homogenous. Uh, so effectively, if you're going to do migration or fault tolerant high availability, uh, that's going to be at the cluster level. Um, and that's done because if you've got a rack of machines, if you're racking an entire set of uh, machines at a time, those are going to tend to be homogenous. Migration across them is fine because you're, um, you're not losing processor options. Um, and, uh, and also your networking will tend to be the same. Uh, you get out past that if you have to move, say, from, uh, from a, a two-core machine to a four-core machine. Uh, depending upon your hypervisor, that may just fail. And, uh, and so you tend to want to make your cluster, cluster can be an entire rack of machines, but you want that cluster to be homogenous. All right, so um, right before I jump into showing off CloudStack and hopefully generating some participation from you guys, um, if you want to come talk, ask questions, get help, hash CloudStack on irc.freenode.net. My nick is KE4QQQ. Um, there's forums. As a forum hater, I encourage you to not go there. Um, there are mailing lists, which are where you really want to go. And you're free to email me or catch me at the conference. I'll be here all weekend. So let me, uh, let me bring up a web browser and show you the UI real quickly. And I don't have it in that browser. Oh, yes, I do. Yeah, it's going to make me register again. Maybe. I think I remember my password. All right. Let me go to another one. So this is the dashboard and it provides lots of useless information. And I say it's useless because these alerts age very slowly. So something that may no longer be critical um, shows up here. Uh, this is nice for management types who want to see, wow, we're, we've got 55% of our CPU resources allocated and things like that. It's pretty. Um, Aside from telling you whether you're out of uh, IP addresses or CPU or RAM, it doesn't do a lot for you, so I'm not uh, terribly big on it. You'll notice that this system is a single machine cloud. Everything is literally running on a single box, which isn't terribly exciting, except it means you can easily do something. Um, this one's uh, based in Fremont, uh, Fremont California. Uh, and so you'll see, you'll see we do storage at the cluster level, and you have to have 
shared storage if you want that fault tolerance and you want to be able to, to migrate machines between hosts. You can use local storage um, as long as you understand the, the downsides to that. Um, secondary storage is, of course, at the pod level. Uh, so the pod shares, uh, all of the clusters in a pod will share secondary storage. Um, I think there is only a, just a console proxy that's running or SSD. Here's the router and you won't be able to see that because that's inside the VPN, I think. Um, and I will try and get access to demo four so you can play with that. It, there will certainly be access to it um, later in the day. Um, but effectively, you, uh, you can come and manage volume. You can add disk space to machines. Um, uh, you can snapshot uh, individual volumes if you want as opposed to snapshotting instances. And you can look and see all of my instances. So we have this idea of both accounts and users. And accounts, a, an account is always a user, but an account may also have multiple users. Um, and you'll notice there is only an admin account, but I can add to that admin account additional users. Um, and you'll, you'll notice there's only a single one right here. Um, that allows you to, uh, uh, to effectively divide up um, a single account if you're doing things for billing purposes. So you want to say um, the guys who are developing this new software, they need a, a, uh, a test platform on which to do that. Um, and you're charging them back, for instance, uh, you can have a single account with all of their users integrated. Um, if you're using our latest version, you can do LDAP. Um, and by extension, you can do AD um, if, you, if you must. Um, AD is a terrible bastardization of, of LDAP. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry for anyone who has to use it, but uh, even though I have many times in the past. Do you use straight LDAP for the yes, straight LDAP is very clean. Um, we also have this idea of domains, and domains are effectively to allow you to nest uh, account permissions. Um, so typically what you would do if you were a service provider is you would come in and say, this is the Acme Corp. And you're going to have their sysadmins become admins on, uh, on that domain. Within that domain, you can, of course, nest. And I've changed tabs, apparently. You can nest additional domains to whatever degree you want. Um, so if you don't have LDAP in place, you can, uh, you can simulate the hierarchy there. So you could say <coughs> project foo within Acme Corporation. And then we're also going to have a test dev environment. And beneath that, we'll have junior sysadmin test environment because we don't want them to have access to everything. And so you can segregate resources. And you'll, you'll notice that you've got a resource limit. And so you could have, you know, we're going to have a limit that you can't have more than 50 machines. Uh, for the entire test dev environment. And then junior sysadmins get a subset of that. They'll inherit the parent, of course, if, if it's not configured. Um, sadly, our events, uh, at least in the UI, I just really, uh, I think it uh, lacks a lot. It will write to syslog, and there's also log4j running. Um, so. Nobody wants to use this uh, unless you're really, really the end user. 
Um, and then we, uh, we have these templates. You can create your own. You can boot from ISO. Um, we've been working with uh, Marek Goldman from Box Grinder, and since it's public, it's been happening on a public mailing list. Netflix has been working with them as well to get Box Grinder support. So you can be running a Box Grinder VM and say, I want to spew out this uh, this machine, and I want it to have um, I want it to have these characteristics with this operating system and this software, and it will go create the image, automatically spin it up for you, etc. Um, sadly, uh, Pixie booting is very rudimentary here, um, uh, and it largely depends upon the hypervisor. So, KVM, recent KVMs at least, will support Pixie booting. Um, a really recent Zen server does it half the time. Um, and uh, that sort of kind of works uh, in VMware. Uh, VMware's Pixie implementations depends upon the NIC that you're using. Um, but, uh, but currently, again, because most people are doing this right now as a service provider, they're providing templates. Uh, they may let you do ISOs. Um, and you'll see, you'll see very few templates here, I think. Um, so here's a CentOS 5.3, no GUI, um, and that's a Zen server template. And here's, a, I think this one's KVM. This is a KVM CentOS 5.5, no GUI template. And if I can do it, I don't know if I have enough resources left. You can come through and add an instance, tell it what you want to base that on, what template. Um, you can define, I want a small HA. You can define the service offerings for your users, and I'll show you the service offerings in a bit. But essentially, you can define storage, initial storage space, amount of RAM, and amount of CPU. Uh, you can add data disk if you care to. Uh, security groups, uh, so effectively there are three different modes for, um, for networking. The first is basic, where we assume a completely flat network. Um, there's zero routing involved, zero real routing involved. Um, that allows you to use security groups, which effectively says we're bridging a NIC, and within that NIC, um, all the traffic's having to pass through. We can filter traffic within that, uh, within that bridge as it's coming through. Um, so you can, you can choose a default security group, and by default that means you get to, you can egress, but you have no ingress at all. You can't communicate to, uh, to other VMs that are running on the same host, uh, because they also can't get ingress, um, but you of course can get out to the, to, uh, the internet or, or wherever. Um, you can define your own security groups. You can apply them at create time. You can have them set as default. You can take away the option from the user so that they have uh, an automatic, um, they have no choice in the matter. Um, so I'll quickly show you service offerings. Um, sure. Yes, actually what you do is you would make an API call rather than doing it through the UI. Um, but the, the uh, APIs end up being a single long URL that you're calling, and that's decidedly bad for a presentation. Um, typically though, you would have your monitoring system or your automated provisioning system calling the API and saying, this is the type of machine I want, this is the amount of RAM, this is the amount of CPU, Go spin that up, and it will spin it up uh, quite rapidly. As a matter of fact, I think, oh, you'll notice I didn't have, uh, I think this is because I'm out of addresses. Um, no, I'm out of memory. I don't have enough memory to, to spin up another one. There's only four gig on the box. Um, the, uh, 
So yes, you can spin up 50. There are people who are actively spinning up 100 at a time. Um, we actually had a customer, um, a hosting customer who has a NASCAR sponsorship, um, who complained to us that when you create 200 at a time, that, uh, that it takes too long. And we had never tried spinning up 200 machines, 200 VMs at the same time, uh, and ended up having to go fix that. Uh, there's significant resource contention when you try and do that. But uh, um, so the bottleneck is how we handled, uh, they were using Zen Server as their uh, hypervisor. And what we do with Zen Server is we copy over a single VHD file and uh, for, each, for each type of machine, each template that comes over and every single machine boots off that. Um, and they, they're effectively doing copy on write um, for, uh, uh, for making local changes. So the, the single disk image gets copied to primary storage. They all boot off of that. But then they're starting to write log files. And so they're writing that to their own. So it was a couple of things. You've got all of those, um, all of those machines that are trying to read a single file. Um, they're all then trying to write to their own file and they're having to calculate the copy on write portion. So they're, they're effectively only doing a change set, but they're each having to track how they differ from, uh, from the machine. And when you do 200 of them at once, all spinning up, it was, uh, it was dramatic. So we've, we've, uh, we've done some optimization there, but still you want to spin up 200 machines, it's going to be a traumatic experience. Yes, sir. Yes. Can you use the GUI to create your API calls and save them all rather than having to manually type in all your selections? And no, but that is an that is an excellent feature request. Um, the uh, uh, no, effectively you can't. Um, sadly, what we would tell you to do is here's our API documentation. Here are the here are the subdivisions. Please go create this massively long URL. Um, I don't remember where I was going, but we'll. Uh, so you can come and edit uh, service offerings, uh, which is effectively allow you to determine whether it uh, has high availability, how much memory, CPU. You can specify storage type, which is local or shared. Um, and uh, you can also add tags. And so one of the things that you'll see if you don't do the fault tolerance or high availability correctly is you'll have a cluster of three machines and you'll say, well, I need a little more fault tolerance than what's automatically there. So I'm going to run a machine running MySQL and another machine running MySQL and One's going to be master and one's going to be slave and it'll automatically take over if things fall over. I will make sure that those start out on two different machines. If, you're, if one of those hosts dies though, it's going to migrate that, the machine that died to another machine. So you could have both your master and your slave MySQL running on the same piece of physical hardware and you just reduced your fault tolerance. So you can add tags that will do a number of things. It can uh, determine the type of storage that you're going to hit. So if you want to make, uh, if you want to make available um, uh, a service offering that has access to uh, solid state disks, uh, or if you want to have uh, an offering that has really slow 5400 RPM SATA disks that are in a gigantic RAID 5 array that's going to fail really quickly, um, you can offer that to people as well. And you can, you can use those tags to determine hey, I want to only go to this class of machine. I only want this type of storage. Um, I even only want this type of network. And uh, you, can, you can add those tags to additionally restrict a service offering. Um, you can also define disk and network offerings if you so desire. Um, uh, this, is, this is set up with a basic network. And I, anyway, going back to the, the network offerings, we have a basic network which assumes that it's a flat network. 
we have two types of advanced networks which are built around VLANs. Uh, the first assumes that you're going to provide an external router to route everything. And the other type of advanced networking assumes that CloudStack will be running a software router that will handle routing between those, VM, or between those VLANs. Um, and then it goes downhill from there because it gets increasingly complex. Any questions that I can answer for you at this point? Yes, sir. Um, this, the, the question is, is there any integration with VMware or Cisco's Nexus? Um, with VMware, I think that's coming. I don't know because that's not floss because that, that API that VMware uses that we had to adopt is not floss. And for better or worse, I don't care about it because it's not floss. Um, and I also don't use it. So I, I couldn't tell you what the state of that is. I've been hearing people talk about it. Um, with the Cisco, um, I honestly don't know. Um, most, of the, most of the hardware networking APIs are sadly not free to redistribute. And so you are left with either the choice of writing your own and supporting it or to use the vendors, which isn't free and you can't freely redistribute. So um, I, don't, I honestly don't know. That. Yes, sir. Do you want to know what they are or what we support? Um, so the question was, what, are, what about our storage backends? Um, if you read our documentation, we say we support iSCSI and we support NFS. Um, the people at Gluster have written, uh, have written, um, have written code to integrate Gluster for us. That hasn't been accepted yet. Uh, we've had someone write a clustered LVM uh, addition to CloudStack uh, that's currently under review for, for inclusion. Um, we can do anything that, that your hypervisor will do a shared mount point as. So, you know, if you really want to do Ceph, Ceph's a bad example because it's more object based storage. If you want to do um, CloudFS or you want to do um, OpenAFS, uh, you can do that. But you have to go in and make the mount points and arrange for the hypervisors to actually mount that. Um, and we don't care at that point. You just tell us what the mount point is. As far as integrating it and managing it though, um, NFS and iSCSI are, are the long-standing defaults. Um, we're working with the Sheepdog folks to do that, and of course, Cluster and, and Clustered LVM have, uh, have code that just hasn't been accepted yet. We're in the process of getting that, getting that reviewed and actively merging that bit. So, um, so we don't care. The one thing that I think we're missing, so we do compute and we do networking, um, and I'm sure the CloudStack guys, or OpenStack guys, when they come to talk in a few minutes, I'm sure that they will, uh, they'll tell you about Swift. Um, we currently do not do storage as a service. Um, and uh, we're going to end up adopting at least Swift for, uh, for object storage. Um, and we're going to store snapshots, at least initially there. Um, and uh, Swift has proven thus far to be relatively reliable, and uh, um, we're uh, we're excited about seeing that because I think that opens up uh, a lot of additional. Once you get over the that initial hurdle of dealing with object-based storage as opposed to file-based, it's our block. Um, it's uh, every moving to a different type of object-based storage is relatively easy. Any other questions? One more question. Sure. Uh, you We do not currently support Spice. Um, it's coming. Uh, there's actually a, a, an effort by a partner of ours to do virtual desktop. And, and the question was, uh, what about, we've talked about 
uh, virtualization, but what about desktop virtualization? Um, we're not doing what is at least being done publicly, which is most of what I have the insight into, is not, there's no BDI efforts that are heavily ongoing. I know that some of the partners that CloudStack has engaged with, uh, namely RightScale, are actively working on BDI solutions. Um, there's an interesting, uh, an interesting piece right now called MyCloud uh, that got announced Tuesday, which is effectively you're taking our uh, agent software and we provide you an ISO and it runs on Fedora or Ubuntu and we'll give you that ISO, drop it in, uh, boot your machine to it and it will automatically register to uh, an outside management service, which means you don't have to handle configuring the network, which is painful. You don't have to worry about setting up your management server or managing it yourself. And uh, the, first, the first service provider adoption of that is, is RightScale. So effectively, you can use any of the clouds that RightScale uses as public clouds if you need additional resources. And also manage your, uh, your private clouds so you keep your storage and your compute stuff that you care about keeping private. You keep that all um, inside your LAN and they effectively handle managing it, moving jobs or machines between uh, private and public. And that looks very interesting. At least the agent side pieces of that are, are free software. I'm not sure, and Libra software, I should say. I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure about the, uh, the management piece of that, but effectively that would allow you to run a federated cloud where you could have groups of people uh, boot up machines and effectively donate CPU and storage and uh, and then they could sell it to you, rent you space or you could work as a co-op and just migrate workloads between them. Um, that's exciting. Federated Cloud uh, I think will be very interesting. Um, I'm excited that the agent piece is. I, I've asked for clarification on whether the the actual management piece is open source or not, and I don't know. Um, certainly the vast majority of it is checked into our public Git repo, so uh, even if we don't go out and build it for somebody, it's not, uh, it would not be outside the realm of possibility to build it yourself. Have I scared anyone today? Is this what you weren't thinking of? How did I scare you? Tell me what you didn't know. Because I want you to come away from learning from this. I'm, I am a fabulous speaker and I know that, you, that everyone loves listening to me. <laughs> I, can tell, I can tell because Greg de Koenigsberg has not looked up at me once that I'm entertaining the entire crowd. Okay, if I can ask you to do This is. Yes, and and let me tell you some of the things that have been recently checked in that make this even more appealing. Um, so you have this rack of servers and um, they're all not in use, right? I mean, none of them are at 100% capacity. So you're going to be running virtual machines on them so that you can migrate them and, and balance that load. That's one piece of it. The other piece is if you're using 10 of your physical machines worth out of the 40 to you in your, in your rack, um, you can shut down the rest, and we'll send we'll send uh, commands uh, to start the machine if your load starts to increase, so that you need to use it. Um, the, if you look in if you look at our Git repo, there's actually a branch called Bare Metal, where all of this is is uh, sitting, and so it will take care of making sure that enough machines are up. They're they're already registered, and it's going to turn them off because there's not enough load on them. 
um, and it'll spin them up on demand. You can divvy up virtual machines to different users, give them the ability to spin up. You know, I trust you this much, and I will allow you to spin up machines on this network, and I will allow you to spin up only this number of machines, and I will only allow you to consume this amount of storage. And within those constraints, you can do whatever you want, because I don't care past that. You can also lock them down to different operating system types. And, and it will handle all of that uh, relatively well for you. It will, uh, you know, you tell it the list of constraints for your users, and it will go from there. Uh, our, our set of users, here are the constraints for the IT department, or uh, the constraints for my new set of developers who are trying to do something in Ruby. So yeah, I think, I think that solves some of that problem. If I cared about incredibly fast storage, I mean, the kind of thing where you use uh, solid state storage on PCIe cards, if you need that type of really fast access, I would not put it in virtualization. Um, everything else, though, I, I, think, I think has largely accepted the fact that it's going to be virtualized. Um, and we've gotten to the point where either with with drivers like Vert IO or the Zen Paravert drivers that we can, I mean, you can push 400 megabits a second without much tuning on, uh, on Vert IO mix now. And trying to do, I mean, that was unheard of not too long ago uh, to be able to push that much bandwidth. Um, the only other workloads are something where you require very specific hardware. So, um, uh, the old standby is if you're doing stuff that requires a fax card, that will not work well here because you don't have a fax card in every, in every one of these machines. And if you migrate off the machine with the fax card, you just lost the capability. And oh yeah, you have to have a, have a hypervisor that supports uh, passing through devices, which is KVM at the moment and uh, not much else. Um, and we don't support pass-through devices anyway, so it doesn't matter. Yes, sir. Um, it is. It's something that well. So the management server piece, you would certainly install on top of CentOS or Rail or or Fedora or whatever. Um, the hypervisors themselves, it, it's going to depend upon the hypervisor. Zen server. It's not Zen on Linux, even though Zen server is Zen on Linux, but Zen, it's actually the Zen server ISO, which is bare metal installation. For KVM, uh, for KVM you really should be using Fedora 15. Um, one, of the, one of the bad things, we contributed a number of patches to uh, Kimu KVM, and uh, they have taken a while to get adopted. They've been adopted. Currently, the only distro that's carrying them is Fedora because they, have, they stay really close to upstream. Um, so if you don't use Fedora 15, we patch Camo KVM, um, which is wrong for a bazillion reasons. But um, effectively, uh, the snapshotting stuff was very suboptimal in KVM initially. And so we, we, uh, we offered up patches to handle snapshotting. And, uh, and those got adopted and finally merged in. Um, so for Rail 6, Ubuntu, Fedora is older than that, we, uh, we patch Camu uh, KVM. If you're using Rail 5 or CentOS 5, we don't even patch it. You just don't have a snapshot ability. Um, and so you're using KVM, you're, you're installing your operating system, and, and then you're installing libvirt and KVM, but then we provide the, the, uh, run, the user space utilities around KVM. There is already. Um, UShareSoft has built a CentOS 5.5 um, ISO that essentially comes off. It says, all right, you've booted into this. Now go visit this URL. And it gives you the IP address and some URL. You go visit that and you say, 
I want this machine to be a management server or I want it to be a compute node and it will automatically install the right packages and just come up for you. It's uShare Soft. And if you search for uShare Soft Cloud Stack, it's there. Um, the, the guys from Puppet and the guys from Ops Code are actively working on getting uh, manifests and recipes done so that uh, instead of um, instead of you installing uh, your this software in a complicated manner, you can just say make sure this manifest gets applied to this machine, and it just happens. Um, that's not done yet, um, but but it's in progress. Um, we're also working on getting this package for Fedora and then for Apple, um, and. Uh, the Fedora piece only has two dependencies left, so I, I think that will happen. Uh, I think that will be in by Fedora 16. We'll see. Yes, sir. So we have not we have not uh, tried. To, the question is: Do you see anything with Open Solaris and Zones? And the short answer is no one has asked us for it yet. And also, we would welcome patches. Um, so right now, um, we don't have, and this is much to my frustration because it makes testing very painful. It means that you have to have, for both Zen Server and KVM, uh, we test to make sure that you have hardware virtualization when you install which means you actually have to have a physical box to install this on. You can't test uh, an environment in a VM. Um, and so I've been pushing for uh, LXC or Virtuoso or Solaris Zones simply to give us a better testing platform. Um, uh, nobody listens to me, uh, which is probably as it should be. Um, and uh, uh, so, you know, if someone wanted to start working on it, we're using libvirt right now for uh, for KVM, so you could certainly take what we've done with libvirt, and and libvirt will manage basically any virtualization platform, so it would not be much of a stretch. Um, libvirt's libvirt does that to varying degrees of success with with uh, virtualization platforms, of course. Uh, their main targets were Zen Server and, and KVM, or Zen and KVM, and um, and the others work to varying degrees depending upon uh, how much the contributor for that particular hypervisor or virtualization technology invested in it. Um, so I've started having conversations with Dan Walsh to see if we can get a policy written. Right now we do not support SE Linux or SVIRT and we tell you to turn them off. Um, I personally think that's a Bad mistake. Um, part of the, part of the problem, uh, and, and I'll just be perfectly honest about cultural issues that uh, that cloud stack and cloud.com have, is that the vast majority of our company came from proprietary software companies, and when you're talking about needing an SE Linux policy written in from a proprietary standpoint, that means you need to find an SE Linux expert and hire them and have them write it. Um, and hopefully that's one of the problems that I'm helping to solve is the cultural issue where you happen to know people in the community or you can go find them and can ask, at least ask for help. Um, and so I've started talking to Dan Walsh about writing that because I think that's necessary before, before that's ready for a Fedora release and I've, I am actively trying to get it into Fedora. Uh, for Fedora 16. Um, so coming, not there yet. Um, uh, the big problem is you've got to do so much to make sure that you get all of the, the uh, when you're operating in um, permissive mode, you've got to get all of the uh, ABCs so that you can start writing your policy around it, which means you've got to start exercising a lot of functions and uh, um, that's a lot of work, and I'm, I'm sure we will, uh, we will not get it right the first time, but it is on the roadmap. It is it's not there yet. I mean, right, right now, if you look at our documentation, we tell you to disable SE Linux. 
And I personally want to see SC Linux and SVIRT uh, in place, at least for KVM. Yes. Um, that that is true. Um, ironically, the defense contractors seem far more concerned about that than than the government types. The government types are wanting us to uh, uh, to get various certifications. Um, yeah, um, and. Uh, so, I mean, literally, we, we've been having uh, guys from the Air Force showing up ask, in IRC asking uh, security questions and, well, maybe we need to help with that. Um, so, uh, I am not. I, I did not know of its, its existence. We'll talk. I'll let you buy me a beer or something. Any other questions that we'll, you want to ask? I, yes, sir. How much trim are there um, differences? Do you guys do you do dual lane tires? Yes. How many are there? Uh, we, we can do, um, we can even, if you don't mind the non free APIs, we can even manage your switches. So you bring a, you bring a new node online and we'll make sure that. Uh, that you're getting the correct VLANs in the trunk port. All right, so what we're going to do, we're at, uh, we're about 10 minutes after 10. We will take a 10 minute, 10 or 15 minute break and uh, the, uh, the OpenStack guys should be here very shortly. I don't know you. You're not, I'm not, I'm not Jordan. you're not Jordan. Um, so uh, you're here already, so 10 or 15 minutes, and that'll give us time to switch out computers and mics and um, hopefully get you some bio breaks in. What about this? I can help with I like it. it. We have the same problem. What would happen if you did this? You gave me a I found a problem. How do you do that? that? It's like this. Well, I disagree with it. Really? Who would have thought of that? Let's put the word out. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.